morning, and welcome to worship in the parking lot on this gorgeous eighth Sunday after Pentecost. It's good to have you here with us this morning, those of you who are here in the parking lot, and also those of you who are, are watching online. Um, welcome. It's good to have you here. Just a few announcements to, before we get started. First of all, we'd like to express our sympathy to the family and friends of Ron Credlow, whose funeral was last Friday here at Salem. Um, please keep Sandy and her family in your prayers. Also, prayers of Christian sympathy for the family and friends of Clarice Lewick, who passed away last Sunday. Clarice's funeral will be tomorrow at 10 o'clock here at Salem, with visitation one hour prior. Many people to keep in your prayers, you can see them listed in, um, in your bulletin or in, in the e news uh, Please keep those folks in your prayers also. Help is needed. Um, the outreach is in need of volunteers to help both at Salem West and the Mustard Seed. Um, any amount of time that you would be able to, to give is appreciated. Please call Jake or Dee Dee to find out what times are needed. I want to say thank you to all of you for completing the surveys about reopening um, for in-person worship. Um, we had over a hundred responses in a very short time and thank you, that's just wonderful. Um, also need to say, well, just one, and as, as you know, or as you would guess, we're kind of split, about 50-50, it seems like, um, for starting to worship in person now versus waiting um, till some time in the future. Thanks also to Salem Smart Team, um, who are charged with examining all the pandemic data and coming up with a recommendation that they'll make to council this week. Um, also, keep the council in your prayers as they seek um, the wisest way forward um, when they meet on Thursday. I believe those are all the announcements. Um, there are many more announcements that will come out in the e-news. Please um, watch that and, and participate as you are able. We begin our worship with a confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us and in your spirit lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life amen beloved of god by the radical abundance of divine mercy we have peace with god through jesus christ through whom we have obtained grace upon grace our sins whatever they are are forgiven let us now live in hope for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as forgiven sinners, we sing, my hope is built on nothing less.
turns out we can have conversations, whether in the parking lot or we're um, online or in, in person. Um, so there will be a greeting that comes, and, and your, your response is either, and also with you, or if you have a, a phone in your hand, you can press the heart button, or if you have a, a, a car horn under your hand, you can press that also. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. <laughs> and everybody is now awake and dear with. Yeah. <laughs> Let us pray. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. There are no other gods besides God. The word of the Lord does not fail to come to pass. We can trust in God through whom Israel and we are redeemed. A reading from Isaiah chapter 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from the old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And the psalm is from, uh, found in Psalm 86. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I will thank you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and glorify your name forevermore. For great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the pit of death. The arrogant rise up against me, O God, and a band of violent people seeks my life that have not set you before their eyes. But you, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and full of kindness and truth. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the child of your handmaid. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Jesus tells a parable about the coexistence of good and evil in this world. God's judgment will remove all evildoers and causes of sin, but not until the end of human history. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, 
collect the weeds first and bring them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all e evildoers and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sisters and brothers in faith, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who went out and sowed good seed on his land. But when the seed sprouted, the servants came running and told him that the field was full of darnel, a poisonous plant that looks, looks a lot like wheat in its early stages. And the servants' questions kind of echo our own questions. Didn't you sow good seeds? How is it that poisonous weeds are growing? How could this be happening? Is this God's will? And why does God allow evil to happen to us? The master's first answer is absolutely clear. It is not the master's will that this has happened. An enemy has done this. When evil happens, it's, it's natural to blame God for allowing bad things to happen or to sit back helplessly and say, it must be God's will. But Jesus says a resounding no to that. God sows good seed, not bad. God does not will that evil should happen. It was not God's will that Romans killed the early Christians. It was not God's will that Jerusalem be destroyed. It was not God's will that planes fly into buildings. An enemy has sowed these seeds among us. And then comes the servant's second question. Shall we go and put out, pull out the evil weeds? It's a question we all ask after being assured that God does not will evil. Shall we go out and fight for you, Lord? And just as I try to start swinging my righteous sword like Peter in the garden, Jesus says, no. No. Don't try to uproot evil. Let the weeds grow until harvest time. Live with them and among them. And then God and the angels can separate them. I mean, doesn't that answer just leave you unsatisfied? It just bothers me. <laughs> just when I get ready to do some good, Jesus, Jesus stops me in my tracks. I mean, why would he do that? Is he saying we should just sit around and sit back and allow evil to exist? I mean, how can we do that when young men are stalked and killed while jogging in the neighborhood? How can we do that when airliners are hijacked and flown into buildings? It seems like the weeds are not just among the wheat, they actively hurt the wheat more than even pulling, up, pulling them up would, doesn't it? So would have said the Pharisees, the religious leaders, that Jesus butt heads with all the time. You can't just allow evil to exist. You've got to resist it. Separate yourself from it. So they identified 613 laws that one, from the Old Testament that one must follow so that you can know who is good and who is evil and whether you are among the good or the evil. They ended up alienating many of their Jewish comrades for whom strict holiness was not an option. Someone had to do the fishing and the farming and even the tax collecting after all. So would have said the ultra-right-wingers at Qumran, a place out in the desert by the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They said you must physically separate yourself from evil, pull out all the weeds in a life of denial and isolation, 
and they may have been very pure, but they ultimately bore no fruit. That community eventually died out, as did all of their beliefs. Only pieces of scroll remains. So would have said the zealots, the nationalists. They thought that the only way to deal with evil was to fight it in a patriotic battle to the death. They killed all the Romans they could. They fought until Jerusalem was overrun. And the very country they loved was utterly destroyed, gone from history for nearly 2,000 years. There's another part to this parable, a part that's even more difficult. It comes, it comes at the end when Jesus talks about the final separation at harvest time. It's a scene of judgment. Some seeds go to the barn, others go to the fire. And those, I don't know about you, but those judgment scenes always make me nervous because everything's out of my hands. I'm never sure if I'm going to make the grade. No, that's not true. That's not true. The truth is, if God judges fairly, objectively, I will not make it. Neither will you. We've all admitted as much in our confession this morning. If God is going to judge the evil ones, none of us are going to make it. By our own confession, evil is not out there somewhere. It's right here. And you know it, and I know it. And God knows it. And that's why judgment scenes are so frightening. All of us, all of our roots, are intertwined with evil roots. And were our Lord to pull up all the evil weeds, you and I would be cast in the fire with the weeds. And that's when we can hear the hope in Jesus' parable. God's way of, judge, of gardening is not judgment, but mercy. God allows evil to exist even right here in the church among believers because God knows that to destroy evil, God would have to destroy us. And God allows you and me to exist not because we're so good, not because we're on God's side, but because that's the sort of merciful gardener our Lord is. Our Lord is patient. He knows that the seed sown among us is good seed. He knows that there will be a harvest in spite of the weeds. So instead of rototilling the whole thing and starting over, our merciful Lord is content to let us grow. Maybe Evil happens in our lives and in our communities because, because this is the best God can do without starting over. It's the price God pays, it's the price we all pay to simply exist. Evil will have its share for now. It's kind of like the conundrum we found ourselves back in back in Vietnam. One day a reporter asked a soldier why they destroyed a village and then burned it to the ground. His answer was, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. In fact, nobody was saved that day. Certainly not the village. And evil was not rooted out. And we seem, seem, to, have, we seem to have to keep learning that lesson. From Iraqi freedom to Abu Ghraib, we've relearned that we are not completely good and our enemies are not completely evil. We're all a strange mixture of the two. And we are never more dangerous than at that moment when we think we are in the right and the other side is evil. There's an old Batman movie, I can't remember if it's like the first series of them or second, but anyway, it's called The Dark Knight. It explores some of the, those same conundrums we deal with. How in the midst of trying to do good, we can become as bad as the evil we hate. Wheat and weeds together, even in the very best of what we do. Our Lord allows both to coexist until the day of harvest, when good and evil can be properly sorted out. 
I'm not a good gardener. I don't know if you know that about me. Um, I'm a terrible gardener, in fact. But one, one thing my poor gardening habits taught me is that there will be a harvest in spite of a few weeds. As long as they didn't take over completely, I still had plenty of tomatoes and peppers to make salsa in the fall. And the weeds, they became either ground cover or compost. Jesus insists on letting both grow together. In the community, I suppose that means keeping the door open. Don't try to close ranks or raise the requirements. For now, we are about coexistence and nurture of even the tiniest plants. One good wheat seedling is worth many weeds gathered around it. Don't kill the vulnerable and tender good trying to root out the evil. There'll be plenty of time at the harvest for separation. God has sown good seed among us, and that seed sprouts and bears good fruits of service to the neighbor. Do you see it? Of course you see it. In acts of mercy, like when you call on those isolated and alone by the pandemic, or when outreach delivers furniture to a family who has nothing. Our Lord's seed is bearing good fruit, just like he promised. But an enemy has sowed another seed. You can see that among us too. We are all believers with feet of clay. One moment we may do something truly selfless and beautiful. The next moment we may do something incredibly selfish or cruel. The parable of the wheat and the weeds calls us to nourish that which is good. And it also calls us to be patient because it is God's job alone to judge, not ours. And the kingdom will come in God's own good time. For now, our Lord keeps the door constantly open. The kingdom is a place of nurture which allows the good seed to grow in spite of the weeds. Some might call our Lord's way of gardening lazy or wimpy. I call it costly. It's the easiest thing in the world to judge. Much more difficult is sharing mercy with those who do not deserve it, like our Lord did, well, well his whole life, but while hanging on the cross. Remember how he opened the kingdom's doors to two guilty thieves hanging with him? Remember how we prayed for his murderers rather than calling judgment down upon them like I would have done. Our Lord's patience and mercy are not wimpy. They're full of courage and grace. And to a clay-footed believer like me, it is sweet comfort to know that when the day of judgment comes, that merciful one who invited thieves and murderers into the kingdom is the one who will judge you and me. You and I were never going to be perfect. Our church will never be perfect. With our Lord's help, we can be a community of patient gardeners like our Lord has been with us. And our community can be a place where tender shoots of faith sprout and grow in spite of the weeds among us and in us. Amen. And we need to sing. We plow the fields and scatter.
Lord be with you all. And also with you. Also with you. <laughs> Let us pray. God of harvest, you sow the good seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ into your field. Help your church throughout the world to be both diligent and patient, full of resolve and gentleness, that our witness may be faithful to your intentions. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of all space and time, your whole creation groans in labor pains, awaiting the gift of new birth. Renew the earth, sky, and the sea, so that all your creation experiences freedom from the bondage of decay. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of all nations, teach us your ways, that we may walk in your truth. Mend the fabric of the human family, now torn apart by our fearful and warring ways. Mend our country as we deal with racism and all the, the conflicts among us. Guide us by your mercy, grace, and steadfast love. Hear us, O God. God of hope, you accompany those who suffer, and you are near to the brokenhearted. Open our hearts to your children who are lonely and abandoned, who feel trapped by despair, or all who suffer in any way. Especially today, we pray for the family and friends of Clarice Lewick, the family and friends of Ron Cretlow, Teddy Scadham, Lenore McBroom, Herb Schoen, Levon Reeves, Henry Hutchison, Steve Holmvig, and those we name in our hearts. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of the seasons in the midst of summer, give us refreshment, renewal, and new opportunities. We pray for the safety of those who travel, for the safety of those who, who work in essential industries. We pray for those who cannot take the rest they need. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And receive our Lord's benediction. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen.
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. God. <laughs>